Well, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's just gone eight o'clock. So thank you for those of you who have been prompt. Uh, we may well have one or two more people turn up uh, as we get going. Uh, good morning again. My name is Jonathan Nails and uh, very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is on leading resilient organisations and it's the latest in our series on resilience. Um, we're going to be recording this session today, so uh, we'll be able to make this available afterwards as well. Uh, I'm just by way of background, uh, I'm the founder of Metzana Partners. Uh, I began as uh, an athlete, then became a sports psychologist, and for the last uh, 25 or 30 years, I've also been working in sport, uh, in business rather, as an executive coach, and, uh, team coach. And today I'm really pleased to be joined by my good friend and colleague, John Anderson. I'll let John introduce himself. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, yeah, good morning and, uh, and welcome to everybody. Looking forward to sharing uh, this morning. Um, I'm a, an executive performance coach and I'm an associate with Medsana Partners. Uh, my background, I have experience in the Royal Air Force and also um, as a coach and performance director in, uh, in high performance sport, and more recently um, as an executive performance coach, particularly working with uh, clients in a, in, a, in a business environment. Um, my, my passion is for, is for supporting people to, to unlock their talent and achieve their full potential. And I'm very much looking forward to this session this morning. Thanks, John. So we are members of Metsana Partners, a, a company of six. We're team development specialists and high performance experts. Uh, what we aim to do is really combine some really deep psychological expertise with a lot of experience of working with teams and leaders, both in sport and business. And our mission and our purpose really is to help organisations thrive. And we think the best way of doing that is by working with leaders and their teams together. Uh, so today's focus is on leading resilient organisations. Uh, we're going to start by defining what we mean by organisational resilience. Uh, John will then talk about particularly the role of the leader in shaping resilience through setting clear purpose and having uh, the right sort of values in an organisation. I'm going to then talk a bit about the importance of ensuring capacity. Uh, and that will bring us pretty much to 8.30 thereabouts, and we'll have some time for questions. Uh, and we'll, so the main body of the webinar, we finished by 8.30, but we'll be staying on for questions beyond that, if anyone wishes. So what do we mean by resilience? Very importantly here, we frame resilience in terms of performance. So it's not just about recovering from a setback, it's about being able to keep on sustainably performing well. Uh, that capacity is based on some individual foundations. So what individuals can do to develop those skills and capacities themselves, how teams work together, and what organisations do and how the culture of an organisation works. So that it's not just an individual capacity, there are foundations across the whole system. And then it is about developing the, the, the process of being able to anticipate what's coming up, anticipate your challenges, responding to them, delivering what you need to deliver, and then having a process of recovery and learning. And that's a cycle and we feel that, that cycle is a really important uh, uh, approach which allows you to perform, not just to bounce back. So today's focus is very much on the organisational aspect of this. In previous webinars, and they're online if you want to check them out, we've talked about the, more of the individual and team components. But from an organisational point of view, there are three things, three areas which are really important. First, that the organisation, the business has a clear purpose, which sustains people and is meaningful. Secondly, that the, the values that you embody within the organisation treat people with care and respect. And thirdly, the question of capacity. You've got to make sure as a leader that you're enabling sufficient resources that allow people to learn, to change and to recover from challenge or setback. So this is the territory we're covering today. I'm going to pass on to John uh, to take us through those first two areas, purpose and values. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. So as Jonathan has said, um, the first step really in preparing the organisational foundations for resilience is to identify your purpose. 
and, and we see this very much as the role of the leader to, to, to actually be the catalyst uh, to support the team to identify their purpose. So what I'd like to do is, is, is share a story uh, and a personal experience um, about the importance of being really clear on your purpose. Uh, and this great picture here with uh, Andy Murray, our, our team leader and flag bearer at the uh, Rio Olympic Games in 2016, coming into the uh, Olympic Stadium in Rio um, with, with Team GB um, following in his footsteps. Uh, and, and that was the start of a, of a fairly momentous uh, occasion for a British Olympic sport. Um, and, and the team, the athletes, they, they won 67 Olympic and 147 Paralympic medals at those games. That actually surpassed the targets of London 2012, which I think we'll all agree had been, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, incredible uh, performance at, at home. And we finished second on the Olympic and second on the Paralympic medal table. And, and, and this really was, you know, the, the culmination of sort of 20, 25 years of progression um, for, for this team, because it wasn't always like this. It wasn't always as good as this. So, so let's just go back then from, from that high of, uh, of Rio in 2016. And, and this, this uh, slide, here and, and perhaps Mark Hoyle will, will recognize this location. This, this porter cabin was, was actually the headquarters of British canoeing uh, in 1996 when we got back from the Atlanta Olympic Games. Now, those games, we, we had some very talented athletes and there were some good performances, but Team GB won one gold medal and we were 37th on the Olympic medal table. And for, for British canoeing, there was no room at the inn. There was no room in, in the centre at the National Water Sports Centre for us. So, so this was the headquarters. And this is kind of where we met and, and, and kind of started to articulate kind of what we were about, our, our why, and, and, and how we were going to recover from the law of Atlanta and, and, and take the programme forward. So... I think the, what I'd like to share is, 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 is the important aspects of, of defining that purpose, defining your, your why. And I think the first thing is as leaders, because it is a leadership role to, to get this going, we, we need to provide real clarity of purpose and engage our people by supporting them to develop long-term goals that define what success depends on. That's the starting point. And from there, what we know is, is that, that passion, and there, and, and there was loads of passion in that canoeing team, you know, going to Atlanta, and, and that passion carried on. However, passion by itself is not enough. What we need to do is provide real focus and energy around what will make the greatest difference to performance. So to be effective in our experience, a purpose needs to be inspiring and challenging enough that it creates a positive tension. And absolutely importantly, it needs to be owned and believed in by the leadership team. And as the leader, your level of purpose and energy for that is really what will distinguish a true purpose. So thinking back to the, the, the Porter Cabin, and, and uh, that, that was a time uh, when Jonathan and I were, were working together. Uh, and Jonathan, myself as the performance director, and Jonathan as our performance psychologist. And, and I can remember a day, and it was a day in the Porter Cabin with a very small coaching team that we had and the leadership team, and we did all actually fit in, was that we spent a whole day with Jonathan facilitating us to clearly define our purpose. So what, what, what was our why? What, what, why were we doing what were we doing? Because we were putting such a lot of effort in and we had some real talent in the team as well. And this is what we came up with that day, which was to be the number one Olympic canoeing nation with quality and depth of excellence in all that we do. So what I would say to, 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 to everyone as a leader is that in defining your purpose, this is, this is not a time to be conservative. 
This was a team that just came back from the Olympic Games having not won uh, anything at, at all. And, 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 and so this was dreaming your dreams. This was aiming high. And, and you know, this was about big ambition. But the important thing about leadership is that leadership is the capacity to convert that purpose into reality. Now, the one thing we all know as leaders is that, that um, you know, absolutely super to have this kind of purpose and that to be a real driver for the team. But, but you know, progress is very rarely, uh, you know, linear. And it certainly was not for this canoeing team. So there were setbacks along the way. We faced resistance and there were many, many challenges. And, and as the leader, I certainly faced several personal challenges. And we know that leadership can be a lonely place. So it's really important to have that belief in the purpose and learn to be adapt, learn to be agile and to make changes along the way. That's all a critical part of the leadership role. It's much, much more than defining the purpose. It's living the purpose day in, day in, day out. And, and, and in doing that, it, not only is it critical to success, but it's critical to strengthen that personal and organizational resilience that we're here talking about this morning. So we're, we're going to move on now and, and have a look at uh, values, uh, because this is the, really the second step in preparing those organal, organizational foundations for resilience. And, and it, is about, it is about your core values. And, and, you know, as Jonathan said in the introduction, uh, uh, the first area really when exploring our values is, is treating people with care and respect. And within our teams, that's absolutely everyone. So, you know, in, in, in high performance sport, you, you clearly got a lot of care and respect for your athletes and, 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 and the coaches support that and then all the support staff. But it's about everybody in the organization. That, that's critically important. So what, what are our values then? What, what are our values? Well, from our perspective, our values are, are the activities, the behaviors, the beliefs, and the qualities that you believe are important. And they're important because they affect the choices that we make and our satisfaction with these choices. And in many ways, our values are the energy behind our goals. We set our goals, but it's our values that really drive us forward with our goals. And in terms of leadership, a leader's values will have a significant effect on the culture in any organization. As leaders, we cast a long shadow within our organization and, and how we go about our business, how we role model day to day will be noticed by other people. And, and again, as a leader and, and, and thinking about, um, you know, facing challenges, um, it's really important. And I can think of many occasions where you need to look the beast in the eye. There, there will be such significant challenges to overcome and you need to be prepared not to accept the unacceptable. And in this sense, the behavior that you walk past is the behavior you accept and people will notice. So I'd like to, to just move on and, and share a leadership approach and a leadership mindset that, that we've found really helps to build organizational resilience. And, and I've termed this the ORCA philosophy. And the first part of this is, is ownership. And, and this is about giving ownership to individual team members for their area of responsibility. Because what we know about ownership is that human beings absolutely crave ownership of what they do. And if they have ownership, they'll perform better when given it. Ownership creates pride, we function well, and our chances of success increase. The other side of that is a lack of ownership leads to anxiety, aggression, disruption, and decreases our chances of success. Now with that ownership also comes responsibility and responsibility is about delivering on your plan and, and being disciplined and of course if you have responsibility you also must be have accepted accountability for the outcome 
The third area here is commitment. And commitment in this sense means following a plan, even if we don't feel like it that day. Now, crucially, in terms of leadership, it's really important that as leaders, we support and coach our team members to understand, and in many cases, accept the level of commitment required to deliver their best performance. That isn't immediately obvious uh, to many people in the team. That's something that we often have to coach people to, to, to get to that stage. And I believe that's a, that's a key function of high performance leadership. And then finally, I'm, I'm gonna kind of mention accountability again, because you know, as leaders, when we give ownership to our team members, it's also important to help them understand and accept that they are accountable for their own performance. It's not anyone else's responsibility. It's individually accountable for your own performance. So bringing this uh, part of our um, session this morning to a close, um, this slide is the London uh, Olympic, uh, the Lee Valley Whitewater Centre in its Olympic uh, mode in, in, in 2012. And remember the porter cabin uh, in the car park at the National Water Sports Centre. And, and, you know, um, 16 years on from that, we've got this 50 million pound uh, Whitewater Centre just, just north of the, um, of the M25. And I'm really pleased to say our team was successful at this venue and the venue is really successful in legacy mode, which is a great, a, 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 a great story. And, and, and so, you know, things had moved on drastically uh, for, for British Olympic sport. And here are some of the athletes that, that were in our team uh, in, in Rio in 2016. And on this, this particular slide, we have 10 athletes. And collectively between them, in Olympic and Paralympic, they won nine Olympic medals and five of them were gold medals. And through their achievements of winning those nine medals, the canoeing team actually achieved that purpose that we set out in that Port of Cameron to become the number one Olympic and Paralympic canoeing nation. It had taken 17 years. There were some rocks and obstacles and challenges on the road, as I've explained, but it was that defining purpose which held the whole thing together throughout that journey. So really, really pleased to be able to share that with you and, 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 and look forward maybe to, to hearing some of your questions later, but I'll now pass back to, uh, to Jonathan. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, John, brilliant. And uh, I can attest to the Lee Valley legacy. I was there for two hours last night, so it is still going strong as a venue and the sport's still thriving. So let's, let's look at the third aspect, because John has been talking about two of the three foundations to organisational resilience. That's the role of the leader in setting a clear purpose that sustains you over time, and then the importance of values that allow people to perform, collaborate, and thrive together well. But the third aspect is a little bit different, and that is this question of capacity. The key, as, the key point I want to make here is that resilience relies more on capacity than efficiency. And for many years, socially, politically, economically, we've driven for efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. We've cut things to the bone. We've tried to create everything so that it's just in time, it's very lean, and, and that has brought huge benefits. So I'm not against efficiency here at all. But it's really interesting to use the sporting example. Highly trained athletes, who are super lean, super fit, who are training at the edge all the time, you know what? They are far more prone to catching cold than you or I. Yeah. So efficiency comes at a cost. And that cost is resilience. Because the more uh, efficient you are, the more you run the risk of actually losing the capacity you need to perform under pressure and to perform to the unexpected. So for years, we've pursued efficiency, but at what cost, and particularly the cost of resilience. So let me give you an example of this. Uh, smart motorways. I think most of us are from the UK on this call today. Um, smart motorways. Motorways lacked capacity. Someone very clever said, well, look, we've, we've actually got a fourth lane. It's called the hard shoulder. 
we could increase our motorway uh, efficiency by 25% if we use the hard shoulder as a fourth lane. That would be great. Let's, so let's re-engineer our roads, take out the hard shoulder and make that a fourth lane. We'll put in some clever satellite monitoring and speed sensors and everything so we can adapt. Uh, terrific, we've increased our efficiency, but at what cost? And now we're currently seeing these things being re-engineered because they're dangerous, uh, more people are dying with, if their cars stop, it's harder to get your car off the road, it's harder to get emergency vehicles through, and actually they clog up more. They, they are less resilient than the old version. So it comes at a cost uh, and, and leads to really questioning well, what's the real benefit. And again, there's been some re-engineering done to, to make some of these changes. So again, I'm not against efficiency, but the message here is to question whether you're pursuing efficiency at the cost of, uh, of real effectiveness. So by contrast, no one would look at a map of London Underground, the public transport system, and say that's efficient. It was not planned. It, it, you know, if you know anything about the history, it, it grew up, you know, the, the tube stations were pretty random. The tube lines were built by competing organizations. It, it's not efficient by any terms but by gee, it's resilient. Have you ever thought about that? If one tube line goes down for me where I live, I've got about five other ways of getting into London. I catch a bus, I can catch an overground, I can go to a different tube line. It's resilient, it bounces back, it's got capacity there so that if something goes wrong in one part, there are still ways of getting around London. So let me give you a, qu a couple of quotes here by a guy called Tom DeMarco, who wrote a beautiful little book called Slack. I'd encourage you to get this. It's still available. It was written 20 years ago. He said, the paradox is the more things you do to make an organization more efficient now, the greater you impede its ability to change and reinvent itself later on as the business environment changes. And if that is not the opposite of resilience, I don't know what is. If you think about resilience is our capacity to respond, to react, to bounce back stronger, we need to have the capacity to do that. If we're cut to the bone, if we're running hot, then it's impossible for us to respond to the challenges that we don't expect, let alone the challenges that we do. So he goes on to say, with some slack, which is his term for capacity, the business will be vibrant and flexible. Without the right amount of slack, the business becomes brittle and totally inflexible, locked in the presence, in the present, in fact. So, really key principle. We need some slack. We need some capacity. Now, I'm not talking about creating waste. I'm not talking about over-engineering or employing twice the number of people that you need or anything like that. But I think the principle here is to be, as a leader, to really be careful that you balance your need for efficient use of resources and effectiveness with ensuring that you've got sufficient spare capacity to be resilient. Again, if you look at a sporting example, I don't know if you've ever looked at people who swim across the English Channel. Really tough challenge, you know, 22 miles, freezing cold water, tides to deal with jellyfish. These people are very efficient, but they carry some extra weight because they know that they need that extra capacity to, to sustain their performance. So think about where, as a leader in your organization, where can you create a little more capacity? So again, not about over-engineering, not about being wasteful, but where are the areas where by creating a little more capacity, you're going to create greater resilience in those areas where actually resilience and being able to sustain your performance is more important than being super efficient and getting into 100% utilization. Things, so I think about your response time. How, how much time do you give people to do jobs? Do things really need to be done as fast as you're insisting or you're implying that they need to be done? What are the things which actually can be done just as well tomorrow as can be done today? So then you can do the things that you need to do today, today. But does everything need to be done today? Think about your time. Think about your resources. Have you got enough? Can you reallocate them so that you create the capacity to be resilient? Uh, the equipment that you use, and the military is a great example here. You know, SAS, the military, will never go into battle with just one radio, for example. They make sure they've got two. They make sure they've got a backup. Same for you. Is your equipment, is your, your physical resources resilient? Uh, just bandwidth, the time to think. 
the time to be able to reflect, the time to be able to process and think about the challenging world that we're in. There's a lot for people to cope with. Are you, are you creating the bandwidth for people to stop, to reflect, to get together, to talk and process what's going on? Or are you assuming they can just do it in microseconds? The sort of support we give people. The support you give us as, as a leader, as a mentor, and the support you create for teams. These are the sorts of areas where by making small changes to create a little more capacity, you can get big benefits in terms of the amount of resilience you get because you're creating the capacity for people to think, to plan, to recover, to prepare for the unexpected. If we don't create that capacity, people, as Tom DeMarco said, if we're locked in this brittle current presence of just doing, you know, running hot, it's this phrase I hear a lot now, if we're running hot all the time, how on earth can we be resilient? It's impossible. Certainly possible in the long term. People might sustain that in the very short term, but at what cost? And that's when we see people suffering, getting burnt out. Um, um, you know, we're not creating human places to work if we're not creating sufficient capacity in all these terms for people to do their jobs well. So we've got to think more holistically as leaders. We've got to balance efficiency with capacity and resilience and make sure we're building enough in. So, We've talked about, between John and I, these three really important foundations for a resilient organization. And these are things where you as a leader need to take responsibility. You cannot delegate or assign these things to someone else. As a leader, it's your role, as John beautifully described, to set that clear purpose that can sustain performance through the ups and downs, like British Canoeing's purpose. Wow, from 1996, 20 years that purpose and beyond has held true through the ups and downs. The values, how you balance people's well-being, how you balance humans as humans with the, the need to do a job. And this is where the purpose is important. If people, have, if, if people believe in their purpose, that allows them to dig in deep, allows them to, to unlock their, their energy and resources. And then finally, this point about capacity, thinking holistically about your business, holistically about your organization, Balancing the need for efficiency with sufficient capacity so that you can uh, bounce back, you can learn and you can recover. Not getting trapped in, this, uh, trapped in this myth that efficiency is always the right thing, that we've got to be at 100%. No, that is not the way to su successful, sustained, healthy human high performance. We need to carry a little bit of slack so that we can perform well. Brilliant, look, it's just coming up to 8.30. Uh, we'd love now to take a couple of minutes. If those, anyone does need to sign off at 8.30, thank you so much for joining us, but uh, we'll take some questions now. We're happy to stay on for as long as uh, there's interest in questions or responses. So I'm gonna open up the screen so that we can see who's here. And uh, love to hear any questions, feedback, or response to what we've been talking about. So just come off mute or wave your virtual hand or uh, Tim, hello, you're waving at, at us, far away. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan, John and everyone. Um, thanks so much, really interesting half hour, nice wake up call for me. Um, I guess the question I'd ask to you guys as leaders is courting feedback. You know, in my experience, it's the thing I need most and it's the thing I don't always want to hear. But how do you approach that, um, that healthy level of feedback with your team? Accountability, I guess, comes into that as well. John, that sounds like it's a good one for you to respond to. Yeah, great. No, no, thanks. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I mean, when I mentioned accountability, Tim, I think, uh, uh, again, it's a, I think there's a coaching role there uh, as leaders uh, to, be, to, be, to, to be really explaining what accountability is, then everyone's responsible for their individual performance. There is a collective about the team performance. And, and it's the purpose that drives that, but but I think it's it, it, it's 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 just that it's that honesty, uh, Tim, and and it, and it's you know I talked about kind of calling out unacceptable behaviours, um, because it, it, as soon as you let something go, uh, it, it escalates, and and so I think having a, an open and honest uh, environment where where feedback just becomes a natural process, and 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 I think if I think back to um, you know, my time working in a high performance program, 
some of the strongest feedback, uh, Tim, that, that, that we used to get came from the athletes. They, they, they became the guardians of the, of the values and the behaviors. So, so if they seen something that wasn't right, unacceptable, then they would, they would give the feedback. And, and, and what we were doing, myself and the coaches, was coaching them how to give the feedback appropriately. Because as we know, as leaders, that, 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 that there's kind of a, that there's definitely a, you know, a, a good way of giving feedback so that, that it's taken on board and that, and that people kind of accept it. So I think, I think it's about having that open, honest culture and, and not, not allowing uh, any kind of unacceptable behavior to, to go, you know, you, know you, you really need to manage it in the moment is what I would say. Good. Thank you. Uh, th uh, Matt, good morning. Good morning, everyone from Guernsey. Um, I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. J John, one of your um, comments you made was around commitment, and you talked about the need to coach for commitment. And it's really interesting. So when, when I think about the athlete, the, uh, an athlete is fully focused on that gold medal. Or, or in the military, you know, you've got someone basically 24-7 to work on the particular discipline you're trying to get awesome at. I, kinda, I reflect now in a, in a kind of, you know, in a normal civilian uh, working environment, we're actually, we're being asked to, to be a much more flexible, uh, much more kind of friendly organization. And, and the young guys especially have got this idea of portfolio careers. They're wanting a lot, a lot more exposure, a lot more different stuff. But actually that commitment takes time and it takes hours and it takes hard yards. And I see a real conundrum there in getting the two to balance really well. I just wondered if you could share your observations or comments on that. Thanks, Matt. And, and yeah, great, great question. And, and you've, you've kind of covered the full spectrum of my career there from the military into sport and, and now into high performance business. So, so thanks for that. And, and of course, what we know, Matt, is that there are more similarities between those three areas than there are differences. So, you know, commitment in one area, commitment in another area, we're talking about the same thing. It's really interesting because, because you know, my, my experience uh, both in the military, so working predominantly with um, operational aircrew, fast jet pilots, um, uh, and, and, and my time with sort of Team GB is that, you know, individuals come into those environments and, and they are highly motivated, highly mo motivated, you know, to succeed. They have a dream, you know, they have a mission um, and that motivation carries them pretty far along the way. However, and there is a however there, you need more than motivation. Motivation gets you so far, it's commitment that delivers the plan. It's commitment that actually delivers. And, and in my experience as a, as a coach, as a leader, um, actually having a process where, 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 where you, you, you really coach people through the levels of what, what, what is, what does commitment look like in this environment? Because it's, it, the context is important. You know, to be successful in this business environment, you know, what level of commitment do we really expect from you? And how do you go about that? And, and, it, and, and I kind of call the process, uh, Matt, from my high performance days, I call the process a commitment screen. You know, look, looking, at, looking at those behaviors um, that, that are required, um, and, and, and how to overcome you know, obstacles along the way, because what we know is that, that working on anything that's really significant, you will face challenges and you will face obstacles. So, so I, I, I've, I've actually got kind of in my mind quite a structured process with individuals to help them identify through something I call a commitment screen, exactly what that looks like. And it's a journey, and I think you articulated that really well. It, 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 it takes time. And, and I, you know, I've never, I've never been under the misconception that, you know, just because someone is superbly talented, that, that, that with that talent comes the commitment actually to be able to kind of deliver, because the two, the two are sometimes not, not in sync. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think fundamentally it's about coaching, Matt, is what I would say. Yeah, okay, so I take away that's just sort of an alignment piece there, and it doesn't matter what level someone is in an organisation, if you can get that alignment right, you'll get further along the journey. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Adrian, good morning. Good morning, Jonathan. 
How are you doing? Um, really interesting. Very sorry, I, I missed the first few minutes because my computer decided to restart itself and download a, a load of updates. But no, it's re really interesting and a lot of parallels actually um, with, with where we are with our business at the moment. I mean, one couple of thoughts. One of them was um, in the sense of the messaging and the, the visioning piece, which, which Alan talks about. Um, there's, there's a challenge, I think, where that has to scale up. So when you've got a bigger organisation and you've got different layers to it and people are mo perhaps motivated in slightly different ways, then I was just wondering if there's any thoughts on how you um, sort of cascade that simple vision down through a bigger, you know, a bit bigger organisation and get everybody um, uh, buying into it in the same way that, that you described, obviously with a yeah. sort of Olympic team. Yeah, there's a couple. There's two key quick, two key questions to ask people, um, and it works top down and bottom up. If you start from the top, so we're going to be number one Olympic nation. The first question to ask is how are we going to do that? And that how immediately drops you down to the next level of detail. Well, we need good coaches. How are we going to do that? Well, we need the right athletes and so on and so on and so on. How do we get good coaches? That drops you down to another level of detail. So from your, from your purpose or your vision, asking how takes you down into the detail really important then from the from the, the grassroots up so when someone's doing their job and you ask why are you doing this and their why should take you to the next level up and why are you doing that to the next level up and why are you doing that till you get to your purpose so asking how and why is how you create that synergy and it should you know in, it, it's never going to be a complete match but if you ask someone why are they doing it why are you doing your job if they can't give you an answer that somehow connects or then connects by one or two steps to your purpose, then you're out of alignment. It's not always a, it's not always a, a, a direct leap. You know, there's an old story about the you know the the, the sweeper in the the, the the cleaner in NASA. You know, I'm putting man on the moon. That's one big step. Yes. For most people, there's a few steps in the way <laughs> along the way, but you want to be able to get to that purpose. Yeah. yeah. And I guess it's the same with the um, with the behaviours that you know John was talking about, and um, effectively you know jumping on or, or comment on, commenting on behaviours that aren't in alignment with our with our goals. Uh, and um, yeah, I guess that messaging in terms of what we're trying to achieve and, and and that culture needs to be embedded sufficiently at each level such that you know the equivalent. Um, uh, escalation or, or, or commenting uh, it happens at different levels of yeah. the business well the, the thing i'd make a comment there about values actually um values don't really offer very much when everything's working well if everyone's already be behaving in a way that's in alignment with the values you don't need the values values are most important when someone behaves in a way that's out of alignment with them because they're the reference point the values are, are, are give you permission to say, hey, that behavior isn't okay. You can't say that unless you've agreed what the value is in the first place. But if you've agreed, hey, we're gonna be open with one another and we've all signed up to that, you're not being open, that makes it okay to make that challenge. Oh, thanks, that's great, thank you. Good, any, any more for any more while we're here? Last bids going, going up. Oh, Tim's back again. Yep. <laughs> Hello. Far away. Yeah, it was just this. Um, I guess resilience can have different definitions. I was just um, wondering about where's the line in the sand between resilience and then self care, vulnerability, etc. Hmm. Uh, well, look, I, I think it comes down again to the values that you have within your organisation. Um, Certainly the way we would frame it here is that individually, one of the individual foundations is being able to manage yourself, meet your own needs and so on. So there's an individual aspect of this. Um, organizationally though, I think it comes down to 
from a leadership point of view, seeing that the well-being of people is integral to your performance and your success. They are not binary. It's not either or. And I think this is the challenge. Uh, but if you can create a culture where you're seeing that, that, that the uh, more energized, the, the healthier, the happier people are, the better they will perform, then you're going to reduce that risk of it becoming an either or. Okay, I guess capacity is key there, isn't it? And there you go. And if you've got yeah. sufficient capacity, then people have got time to recover and learn and everything else. If you don't have capacity, then you'll get stretched. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Good. Uh, any final check? No? Terrific. Well, look, thank you so much, everyone. That's I really hope you got some value from this morning. Uh, it's been fun to, um, to present and to work with you, John. That's, uh, that's been great. Uh, so thank you very much, folks. Uh, we will be in touch later on. We'll send you a link to the recording from today. Um, and please stay in touch. And if there's anything we can do to help, uh, please get in touch. Uh, we'd love to take this further with you and your organisations. But in the meantime, thank you again and have a great, great day. Hope this has set you up for a, a good Thursday.